Today's podcast is brought to you by Archives, your trusted resource for researching your family history. Archives is a vast repository of historical records, offering a seamless journey through your family's past. Imagine discovering long-lost relatives, exploring genealogical documents, and tracing the roots that define your story. Archives makes research quick and easy with an intuitive approach to genealogy. They keep their search tools simple, but behind the scenes, their extensive record collections are paired with powerful technology to deliver valuable results. Archives is an invaluable resource if you want to make your family history research simple and affordable. Just visit archives.com and let your family history journey begin. That's archives.com. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 287. I'm Lisa Louise Cook. Food has always been at the center of family life. So if you want to know more about your family's history, a logical and tasty place to start would be with your family's culinary heritage. The food they ate and the recipes they cooked can actually tell you a lot about them. And my guest today can help you uncover those stories. So Ashley Covelli is the food photographer, recipe developer, and culinary instructor behind the website, Big Flavors from a Tiny Kitchen. And Lisa Lisson is the genealogy researcher behind the Are You My Cousin YouTube channel. Together, they host the Passing the Plate podcast that explores the intersection of family history, cultural heritage, and culinary tradition. And they're here to talk to us all about it. Hi, ladies. Hello. Hi. Thanks so much for having us, Lisa. Yes, I'm uh, glad to be with what? two Lisas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Lisa Square today, yes. right? That's right. Yeah. And and my listeners will recognize Lisa Lisson. I think you've done the show before. And we've, you know, mm-hmm. crossed paths for so many years in the family history sphere. And so nice to meet you, Ashley, because boy, I'm a I'm always online looking up recipes and doing those things. And I love the food related blogs. Oh, and awesome. So that's fantastic. That's kind of what you're bringing to the table here. You know, let's just jump in because I want to get people excited about, you know, this side of their family history, uh, where we get kind of beyond the records and things. And we really, well, it's a different kind of record, but it's going to tell us some of the stories behind our families. Maybe Lisa, you could take this one. What role do recipes play in actually understanding our family's heritage? Can they tell us something about that? Oh, they can absolutely tell us about our family's heritage. I think at a very basic level, it gives us, I think, a bit of a groundedness within our family. But when you take it beyond that, when I would, this kind of got started in the fact that I inherited a lot of family photographs. And I, for whatever reason, we, we were taking pictures of food way before Instagram and, uh, you know, became popular with food photographs. And I would look at the table and I recognized, and there was always the cornbread on my grandmother's kitchen. It was always the butter beans from the garden and recognizing that, uh, you know, this is what she grew up with. Even though she had left the farm so many you know, years earlier, this is what her mother was cooking. And then as she, t- she goes, but that's what her mother cooked. And so I realized that it was really a reflection of their rural farming life. And that's what was showing up on the table. So it, re- it got me to thinking about, wow, if you're looking at somebody's table and the, and the recipes that are there, what does that say about the generations? Where did those recipes come from? And more importantly, how do we figure out to take it forward? Yeah. I mean, I know when I look at my grandmother's, some of the old photos when she was growing up, her father always has a cigar and pickles and sauerkraut. Mm-hmm. I mean, they were so classic Germans, but, and oysters. He talked about loving to eat oysters. I don't know what that's about, but. Um, I'm, I'm here for it. <laughs> are you? Yeah. You yeah. Know, it's interesting that even just a photograph of food, if you didn't know they were from Germany or you didn't know they were from some area, 
might be clues to actual locations, right? The old country. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Or certain dishes that maybe come out certain times of year of the year. So Mm -hmm. a Christmas tradition, you know, why is it that there's always that particular cake with that particular spice blend that they're using? You know, what it but that's not a common one that we would normally see during Mm -hmm. the rest of the year. You know, why is it that particular cake is being made or that particular cranberry sauce is made that particular way. It doesn't have to come out of a can. It could actually be made with cranberry, you know, indicative yeah. of what somebody might have grown up with. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I I know as a kid, my mother always had sliced fruit on the table and it was peaches and it was apricots and stuff. But, you know, anybody who didn't know our family would might go, hmm, I wonder if they're from California. And we were. I was growing up in California. And that's where all the, the orchards were. And we would go out as kids and, and pick them. And she would slice them up and always have them on the table. Mm-hmm. Ashley, what role has this all played in your background? And when, when we look at pictures from your family book, what do we <laughs> learn about your family? So interestingly, I, I don't have a ton of family photos around food, but um, I grew up in the Midwest and I'm in New York now and I married into an Italian family Uh and I did cook a lot with my grandma when I was a kid, um, but I didn't cook anything like the things my father-in-law cooked and he was a machinist and he worked early in the day. So he would come home and have time. So he thought like, I'll just start cooking. And he grew up in Italy. Then he lived in Belgium and then New York was his third home. So he had this really different way of cooking, very um, different from what I was used to. So when I moved here, I spent a lot of time with him and learned a lot of things from him. Um, and that really helped me become a better cook. And he was one of those just like cook with feel type of people. Um, and I'm, I do like to cook with feel, but I also like, if he made you a certain dish, it would never be the same twice. It'd be good every time, but it wouldn't Mm -hmm. be the same twice. So I really was motivated to say, Hey, when I have my own, family, my own kitchen. I want to be able to make these things and have you here with us, even if you're not. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I was just thinking about, you know, kind of what the elements of, from a heritage standpoint, um, I think about some of the cookbooks that Mm -hmm. my grandmother had in her house, or even her dish towels, Mm -hmm. you know, they were hand embroidered. And what are what kind of, I guess, is encompassed in mm-hmm. culinary heritage that we could be looking for around our house or talking to our family about? I think sometimes seeing the ingredients that somebody gravitates towards. So like my father-in-law, for example, he grew up very poor. Um, they had you know, a couple of vegetables that they grew on their farm, but it was very minimal. So he tends toward a lot of ingredients that might not be seen as like fancy or important, but you can do really interesting things with potatoes and tomatoes and beans. It doesn't have to be this elaborate, you know, oysters I love, but you know, it doesn't have to be like that. Um, So kind of seeing, and then looking at the things that they add in to really bring out those flavors. So like I've got a potato salad with tomatoes and green beans on my website that was from him that I worked on, you know, really getting it down. And it's really simple. And it just has a little bit of vinegar that you toss in while it's still hot. And it's got fresh and dried oregano. And he's Italian, so a lot of garlic. So mm. just those simple things. I mean, he used to do a lot with, he said when he was a kid, polenta. They were very poor. The family would just like pour the pot of polenta on the table and they would all just kind of go at it. So, you know, things that might seem less like a meal for us, um, you could really stretch to make a meal. So I think depending on the background of the person, um, you can really get some good clues there. If they gravitate towards seafood a lot or olive oil a lot, you know, just really gives you a good clue. Yeah, absolutely. How about you, Lisa? What do you look for? I look for the old cookbooks, the vintage Mm. cookbooks, or specifically, you know, I'm looking at, say, my mother's cookbook shelf or what was on my grandmother's bookshelf. So I actually have um, my grandmother's first cookbook. And then I also have, you know, most, a lot of churches would have community cookbooks. The women would make cookbooks. And so I would take those and I would open them up and I'd find the dirtiest pages because I wanted to see the ones that were being, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, cause that told me that that was the most often used recipe or dish. Oftentimes I would recognize them, them sometimes not so much, but um, it, it's a, it, that kind of told me, what was important to them as individuals. I love the old church cookbooks that Mm -hmm. you you can find it 
for from a genealogy perspective, you, those are the ones you're going to find again on somebody's bookshelf. The local library and the local regional sections will often have this type of book because they might be spiral bound. They're probably not widely published, like an Amazon type book, of course. But you can look through those and you can get a sense of that community because if your ancestor, well, look at it this way. If you're a woman and you're part of a, a, a church group, or maybe it's just a community group, it didn't have to be a church, it could be a community group, and they're creating a fundraiser or something that where everybody donated a recipe or two, would you want to be the only woman who didn't? Because right. that might speak to, you know, that right. might speak to your housekeeping skills and at, at a time <laughs> when that was a very important value to them. And so it shows you, if they're in that cookbook, it shows you a little bit about their social circle. Oftentimes mm. you'll find other family members and a lot of the recipes you're going to notice trends. So you might notice if they, if it tends to be a rural farming community, or maybe it is a, a community of German descent. So you might see more of a German flair to those recipes, you know, here in the South, you might see more of some Irish type recipes or um, in certain parts of the state, you can literally do it state to state, you know, within the state, you can see differences. So in the East of being here in North Carolina, you might see more seafood because that's where they were. And back mm -hmm. in the mountains, you're going to have a little more of a German may possibly type of descent. So yeah, well, that's kind of ways to see. similar to what she was saying with the, um, looking for the dirty pages of a cookbook. My So my father's side of the family is from Iran. So when I was a kid and my grandma would come visit, she would bring my stepmom. She brought a cookbook that one side is in English and one side's in Farsi. So she would have my dad translate her notes. So like, here's a recipe. And she would say, well, I add a potato and I do this. And so my stepmom would write the things down. And she's passed since then. And my brother has that cookbook and I tracked down, it took forever to find this cookbook. And I said, we're going to have a Zoom. I'm going to copy down all the handwritten notes that our grandma told our stepmom because I want to be able to make the things the way my grandma did. So yeah. it's, and it's similar. It's like the recipes that were the most used. They definitely had the notes and you better believe I'm going to side with grandma versus what the cookbook says, you know. Mm, are you hungry yet? <laughs> Stay right there because we're going to continue our conversation about family history recipes and gathering them from our relatives. You know, I'm continuing to have great success over at newspapers.com finding articles about my family. It just amazes me how I continue to find new information. And that's why I'm so happy to tell you that today's episode is sponsored by newspapers.com because they really are your go-to resource for unlocking the stories of your ancestors. You can dive into the newspapers where your family's history just unfolds as you search nearly a billion records, and you can do that in seconds. Newspapers.com offers an unparalleled treasure trove of historical newspapers, providing a window into the past with papers from the 17th century all the way to today, newspapers.com is the largest online newspaper archive. It's a gold mine for anyone seeking to uncover stories from the past. So whether you're a seasoned genealogist or you're just starting on this exciting journey, uh, newspapers.com makes it really easy to search for things like obituaries and birth announcements and those everyday stories that shaped your family. It's kind of like having a time machine at your fingertips. And here's the best part. I'm so happy to tell you that our listeners get an exclusive offer. Use promo code GENEALOGYGEMS for a 20% discount on your subscription. It's Genealogy Gems all together, no spaces. And you go to newspapers.com put in genealogy gems, you're going to get 20% off your subscription and you're going to start finding newspaper articles. So I wouldn't wait any longer. Let's go sign up today at newspapers.com and embark on a journey of discovery. Today's episode is sponsored by MyHeritage, a global discovery platform enjoyed by 110 million people worldwide. MyHeritage has it all and offers a full service experience that bridges your past, present and future. The MyHeritage DNA Kit reveals your ethnic origins and finds your new relatives based on shared DNA. It's popular all over the world, and their constantly growing DNA database means that more matches to new relatives are just around the corner. 
you'll receive a percentage breakdown of your ethnic origins from 42 supported regions and weekly email updates as new DNA matches are found. It's also the leading DNA service for anyone with European origins. Make the most of your DNA results with a MyHeritage subscription and access advanced tools for genetic genealogy, like the theory of family relativity, autoclusters, shared ancestral places, and much more. Order your kit today at myheritage.com slash DNA. Already taken a DNA test with another service? Upload your DNA data to MyHeritage for free to receive DNA matches and access new discoveries. That's myheritage.com slash DNA. Ashley, you mentioned cooking alongside your Mm father-in-law. And um, I know probably all of us have have dealt with somebody in our family who just kind of cooks out of their head. Mm -hmm. In fact, I drive my kids crazy sometimes when I make my pies because the dough is something that I just do by feel, by Mm -hmm. experience. I don't look at a recipe. So, but we really want to capture these and document them. Um, What strategies should we use? What should we be doing in order to make sure we really are kind of capturing the essence of Mm. the way grandma or grandpa used to make the food? So my first thing, if you're able to ask if you can go to the grocery store with them to pick out the ingredients, because I feel like that really gives you a sense like, my stepmom, for instance, she made this goulash and I'd say, okay, what kind of meat do we need? Oh, whatever kind they have, whatever's on sale. And I'm like, okay, but that, like, there's a lot of options there. Yeah. So um, she was visiting me and I went to the, we went to the store together. I kind of stayed hands off and I just watched and saw what she got and took notes. I mean, really note taking is really important here. Um, with my father-in-law, sometimes I'd have him come to my house to cook because I would ask him to wait to start because I wanted to see the whole process and he wasn't trying to like fumble the results, but he was like, oh, I just did a li- I just wanted to get a little ahead. I just like prepped a little bit. It's like, no, but I need to see every single thing with this recipe. So, um, you know, really paying attention, looking for things like with your pie crust, textures, colors, mm-hmm. ask if you can feel it when the, when the person gets it to a consistency that they're ready to move on to the next step. Maybe you feel it, feel, see if it's crumbly, if it holds together. Um, I, with measurements, if you're a measure by eye type of person, sometimes I'll ask them to um, measure into an empty bowl and I can then measure it into measuring cups or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, or just, I mean, do a really good, if you're able to eyeball what they're doing and, and take notes and then try it at home. That's really helpful. Um, and just really getting those sensory indicators, like if it looks brown, like they're flipping it when the edges are golden or it starts to smell like the spices are toasting and you can really smell the spices. Any little notes you can give yourself can help when you're trying to recreate it at home. I love that because mm. it could be tempting to just try to do it verbatim what they're saying, but then you're missing all yes. the important rich parts of it. Well, and there's things that, that they do second nature. They've been making this yeah. recipe forever and they don't necessarily, like if you're in a habit where you always do something the same way, you don't necessarily know that that's not how everybody does it. Yeah. And they're not trying to sabotage your recipe usually, but you know, you just really put on a detective hat and get really curious about every single thing that's going on. That's so funny that you talk about the potential of sabotaging yeah. a recipe. I don't know if you guys ever watched uh, Everybody Loves Raymond. Mm-hmm. I used to watch it all the time. Yeah. And I love the episode where Marie is supposedly sharing her, her <laughs> wonderful family recipe with Deborah, but Deborah's making it over and over and it just doesn't mm. taste the same. And everybody's like, eh. And then she, I think she finds the recipe taped or it was two recipes taped together and the real one was underneath and had the right <laughs> ingredients. Anyway, yeah. You know, it's funny. It is a very personal thing mm-hmm. to have a recipe that you're kind of known for. Yeah. To- well, even with chefs, like if there's a chef, like say Tyler Florence, very famous chef, if he's got a restaurant and he makes a dish at his restaurant and then he has it written up for a cookbook, it's not necessarily exactly the same. It's not necessarily tested for a home kitchen. Oh, and right. sometimes they have people like, you know, writing those for them. So it's just, there can be subtle differences, you know, you yeah. just got to keep an eye out. <laughs> 
Now, Lisa, I imagine sometimes though we're we're trying to recreate recipes that might be a couple generations back. These are the people we're finding in the records who have uh, long since passed. Um, any I, tips for maybe how to recreate those? Could we maybe piece it together by talking to everybody who's still around who remembers it, or what? What would you do? I think that's a lot of it is talking with who you can and and pre- even preparing it. Um, and then, you know, even though it's not the same, but if you're serving it and asking people, what, what do you remember? How does it taste? Does this close asking recommendations Did you know, was that too heavy on the spice? Not enough spice. What was the texture like? I think that's really important to be able to do, um, with that. Cause I remember asking my dad, we, we did a thing with my grandmother. Um, she's, she's been passed away many, many years ago, but he had videoed her making her quote unquote famous cornbread it was famous in our family. Cause she's the only one who made it and um, actually has helped me recreate it. But even he said, you know, he said she makes it just, she says she makes it just like her mom. He said, but my grandmother's had a, what had a little bit different taste. He said, and I think it's the type of corn, you know, home ground cornmeal versus store bought oh, yeah. cornmeal mm-hmm. type thing. He said, so I think that's the difference there. So I do think it is being able to interview as many people and it, it family history, as we know, oftentimes comes down to a conversation that can be the most important piece and a vital piece that's often missing from our research. But I think having as many of the conversations as you can, and then knowing at the end of the day, you know, as we come forward and, you know, just as that recipe evolved through their generations, it does continue to evolve at some point. And then, and that the important part for, for me personally is knowing that I can make that cornbread Yes, it might taste a little different. I use a different brand of cornmeal, whatever, than my grandmother. But it always evokes more conversations within my own family and with my children, my adult children. So it's it's, um, recognizing that, yes, these did evolve over time from through the generations. But the important part is we're taking time to actually incorporate them into our lives today. And if you're lucky enough to have the person around set up a phone camera off to the side and capture it. Because let me tell you, I was able to dig and ask a lot of questions from watching that video of Lisa's grandma and like things that maybe you wouldn't necessarily think to include like, okay, was that skillet in the oven before she put in the batter? So like, was it preheating in the oven or what does the label say on that buttermilk? Like what's the fat percentage or, you know, just like little things or seeing how they're adding things in, how they're working it with their hands. Like there's a lot of things you can pick up from watching. Mm -hmm. So you're gathering these recipes. Um, Share with us, how do you like to share them? And in what ways do you use them maybe to generate, gathering some more stories about the family? Because it's not just the food, it's just everything associated with it. Oh, I agree. It's definitely everything that's kind of associated around the food. Um, so I, th- I do find sometimes finding the best way to, to share is can be a struggle. But at this point, I'm doing a lot of di- I'm digitizing a lot of the family um, recipes in order to create um, I'm, at the very basic. I'm just starting a digital file, that, a shareable file online for my family. At, one point, at some point, I hope to get that in a better format, more of a book type format, but Mm -hmm. recognizing if I wait till it's perfect, I might not get it out there as quickly. So I want to go ahead at at the basic, just I'm digitizing things and getting things out there um, as well. And then taking, I am very fortunate in that on one side of my family, we have an annual Christmas family dinner that happens. It's been happening for over 70 years at this point. So um, making sure, and what you'll hear, you know, who's bringing Aunt Violet's cheese ball and who's bringing, and these are not necessarily recipes that came through the generations, but they are our ways of honoring the path, the generations that are no longer with us. So bringing certain foods um, with us as well. So always, you know, that's the time when I like to bring something that my grandmother made or my mom made so that we can, then it do, it always starts a conversation. Mm-hmm. How about you, yeah. Ashley? So part of what, um, I mean, I have a food and recipe website. So part of what I've been doing is taking those recipes, recreating them in my kitchen and like modernizing them when needed. So things like my stepmom's goulash or my mom's pot roast, I've come up with instant pot versions. So they're more doable on a weeknight or when I'm busy. Um, and, and trying to make these recipes that maybe were holiday 
recipes, not just reserved for special occasions. You know, if I can make them, uh, my dad has a kebab recipe and I turned it into like a sheet pan broiler situation. It's not quite the same, but it's got all the flavors and it still like kind of evokes those memories. So just kind of modernizing, making it doable to enjoy more often than like we're cooking something all day on a Sunday and having 30 people over to the house, you know? Um, so there's that. And then just like putting them out there in the world, I've gotten, I've had so many people find recipes that were from my family or my in-laws and now their traditions in their families. And it's just, I think that's what it's all about is just like expanding your horizons and enjoying comfort and togetherness, like regardless of it's your like blood relatives, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's kind of neat that I think that you're modernizing them mm -hmm. because I, I think about some of the old Victorian cookbooks mm -hmm. that I have mm -hmm. and to some of them, it's like, I don't even know how to make heads or tails out of this recipe anymore, right? Because they just talked about things in different ways and they said mm -hmm. a pinch of this. And so you're really, by doing that, kind of ensuring that they can continue mm -hmm. on. They can continue to be used by future generations. Yeah. And I find sometimes that there are things that might have seemed necessary back in the day, but maybe we don't really need like a, a cup of butter. Maybe it could work yeah. with less. And like, that's, it's still the same spirit of the recipe, but it's like, mm -hmm. you know, it's like a little, <laughs> or maybe I want to, you know, sub out um, instead of ground meat using like a vegan ground meat substitute, because I'm trying to make it also so that with a lot of my recipes, people can eat them regardless of, you know, if they have super strict dietary restrictions, that can be hard. Mm -hmm. But you know, like if you're a vegetarian, you should still be able to enjoy kebab and you can, you just need to do it like this instead of with beef or lamb, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, you guys tell us about passing the plate because it sounds like uh, this is something, an adventure that you've taken on to help people, you know, cultivate the stories, um, capture and keep the recipes. Um, Lisa, how did this all come about? Well, this is, it's really kind of interesting, but Ashley and I met um, in an online business type group about eight years ago. And we have been, we were in an accountability group together and we're still holding each other accountable for our, mm -hmm. our own separate um, blogs and businesses. And, but we've always wanted to do something together because we've become such good friends over the years. Mm -hmm. And we recognize that we each brought something to the table. We just weren't quite sure how to put it together. And then last year, Ashley's like, I've got it. <laughs> I've yeah. got it. We need to start a podcast. And yeah. we need another project, she, right? We need another project. <laughs> and as soon as she said, you know, I had been talking about culinary heritage and she's like, well, what if we did this? And as soon as she brought it up, we immediately, it's like all these ideas just exploded mm -hmm. in our heads. And we knew we were onto something because it just was like, we could see it literally in our heads. Yeah. Yeah, it took, we knew like the family piece and the food. I mean, everybody's got memories around food. So we knew it could work together somehow. It just took us a while to get there. But now we have like lists and lists of things that we're working on. And um, we started it with a webinar on documenting family recipes and mm -hmm. how you could actually do that in the kitchen. So we went a little more in depth with that. And then we, yeah, we decided to turn it into a podcast and um, it's been a lot of fun. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, it's at passingtheplate.org. And Ashley, do you have a favorite episode so far that you've well, tackled? Well, so it's upcoming now, but by the time this comes out, I'm going to just like pardon the mouse click noise for just a moment. So the episodes... 34, 35, and 36, those will be out um, the first three weeks of September. So right by the time this comes out, it should be, they should already be mm -hmm. out. Um, we did a an experiment on being a super taster because I always ex suspected that I was because I can really pick up on flavors of things. And then we just kind of did this. It's kind of like a science experiment. Like we always joke that we're going to like, I'll taste this chocolate for science or I'm going to try mm -hmm. Lisa's family's cornbread recipe for science. But this, we mm -hmm. actually kind of did something a little scientific and it was a lot of fun. Oh, how fun. How about yeah. you, Lisa? That was a lot of fun as we did that because we actually, we had both also done our DNA testing. Um, we've done both done it years ago. So we're, and now a lot of those results will show, you know, you have a tendency for this type of taste or you mm -hmm. like this type of, so we did kind of, it was really fun to see how oh, our yeah. taste differences mm -hmm. and then how that might've 
potentially play out in the DNA results. It's, so we had a lot of fun with that. I think one of my favorites had to do really revolved around my grandmother's, one of our early episodes, my mm-hmm. grandmother's cornbread recipe, because there's my grandmother and she was a tiny woman in a very tiny kitchen and with a really big cast iron skillet. So we actually have her video on the, on the website yeah. for people to see, but about how we went about finally getting her cornbread recipe mm-hmm. down so that it can be, we can replicate it. So that's yeah. probably my favorite. Oh, how fun. You guys must be just having a blast with this. and <laughs> We really are, yeah. <laughs> you got to get together so you can have a meal together too, I, right? Well, we have. We've we met have. in person. Um, Lisa's come up to New York a couple of times. And the mm-hmm. first time we met, it, um, we did some like food things in New York City because I'm just a little north of New York City. And then the second time, Lisa's obviously into genealogy and old cemeteries. I'm a former, you know, goth you know, high schooler who loves hanging out in artsy cemeteries. So I said, we have a lot of very historic ones out here. So we, we went to the oh, old yeah. Dutch um, cemetery in Sleepy Hollow. Cause I live right next to the actual Sleepy Hollow. And then we went to um, this really super old cemetery in my town um, looking at gravestones. And it was cool. Cause I got to learn from her, like, what are things like, what are clues that you get from these gravestones? And awesome. It's a wonderful um a wonderful lunch and coffee mm. tasting and I got to learn about roasting coffee beans and yeah uh, all, all in one day I mean it really was kind of a we cover the gamut. <laughs> genealogy day <laughs> yeah yeah I was gonna say that'd be kind of a fun special interest group in a genealogy society wouldn't it Lisa where oh, you it would you have it all around food and get together oh. and share oh gosh I'm yeah, so because most genealogy beans. societies eat they yeah. bring food and snacks so oh yeah, yeah. And particularly oh, the societies that. down south. I love going to speak down south because they feed you well. <laughs> yes, they do. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Well, you can check out um, Ashley's website. It's bigflavorstinykitchen.com. And, of course, the Are You My Cousin YouTube channel where you will find Lisa Lisson. And, of course, you have your blog as well. Lisa, what's your mm-hmm. URL for the blog? Uh, it's lisalisson.com. Great. And it's L-I-S-S-O-N. Correct. Fantastic. Hey, ladies, thank you so much. I, now I'm hungry. I got to go eat. This is the problem with our work. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you, Lisa. Thank and you. Lisa. <laughs> All right. Well, I want to wrap up this episode with some ideas for you on how to find old family recipes. And the beauty of this is, is there's a lot of different places that you can look. And as you're finding them, you may actually find more information about the people who created the recipes or food related items and events and so forth. So, you know, we're not just looking for the recipe, but we're really looking for the story that surrounds them and the people that were involved with them. So for the show notes for this episode, and this is episode number 287, Uh, you'll want to head over to my website to check these out because I've got some links for you at genealogygems.com or at least louisecook.com. Both places will get you there to Genealogy Gems. And under podcast in the menu, go to episode 287. Now on that show notes webpage devoted to this episode, you're going to find a section on called resources. And this is what I'm talking about. I've got um, a collection of blog posts for you on the subject of food and recipes. And so we'll have a link for you to that. There are several recipes from Victorian times, which are kind of fun and might be interesting to try this holiday season. Um, But I also have one in particular I want to draw your attention to. It's called Family History Never Tasted So Good. It is a story from my own research about finding a long lost recipe that I just thought was never going to be found and the almost miraculous way in which it was found. So be sure and check out that Family History Never Tasted So Good. The other food-related item on my website that I really want to draw your attention to is one called uh, Find Family Recipes in Old Newspapers. So on this page, you are going to get the article and the companion video. And I really encourage you to watch the video. This was done with Jenny Ashcraft from newspapers.com. She is so fantastic. And what a sleuth. I mean, she could find anything in newspapers. But the way she uses the newspapers to find the backstories, not only on the recipes, but on the people and the the culture at the time. It's just really, really innovative and interesting. 
So be sure and check out that post with companion video. And that video is also available over at YouTube. But if you watch it on the show notes page, you're going to be able to kind of follow along as we're talking and see more close up some of these uh, gems that she found recipes and advertisements and stories. They're just really terrific. Plus, you might find some recipes that you want to try. (laughs) Some of them sound delicious. They have gingerbread drop cookies. So you know, Anyway, so that sounds good. So I'll have those for you over at the show notes page for this episode. Again, it's Genealogy Gems podcast episode number 287. And if you have some ideas yourself about places to look for recipes and cookbooks and these stories or an amazing story from your own research of something that you've discovered, we would all love to hear it. So on the show notes page, at the bottom of that web page is a comment section. I really hope you'll leave a comment there and tell us your story, your ideas. If you have questions for me, that's a great place to ask the questions. I monitor the comments that come in and I'll be sure to reply to you. You can also send questions and ideas for future podcast episodes to me directly at service at genealogygems.com. And of course, while you're at the website, don't forget to sign up for my free email newsletter. There's a red button on the homepage at genealogygems.com. And when you sign up for the newsletter, it will also send you a bonus ebook. So check it out. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Have a wonderful and blessed week. Thank you so much for listening, my friend. I'll talk to you soon.